Greetings, my name is Louise Dente and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition is a special as we explore the world of medicine and the treatment of women of color. And we are joined by two special guests. To my right, we have Dr. Leslie Farrington. She's a retired GYN doctor. And to her right is another healthcare professional, a registered nurse and a business owner, Miss Beverly James. Welcome to Cultural Caravan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You know, um, this topic really hits home, being particularly as a woman of color and someone who is very much concerned at this time in my life with my health and also the health of other women. Um, tell us, first of all, what inspired both of you to form PULSE, the Center for Patient Safety, Education, and Advocacy. Dr. Farrington. Well, we actually uh, joined PULSE uh, as volunteers. Mm -hmm. And uh, PULSE Center for Patient Safety, Education, and Advocacy was formerly PULSE of New York and formed 20 years ago. Um, uh, by Eileen Karina. And uh, so she's the president and founder of the organization. And we were inspired to join because we both, as healthcare professionals, really concerned about uh, preventable medical errors and its effect on, on our patients and the public in general. So, um, and then as we learn more about uh, preventable deaths, we found out about the statistics that are affecting the African-American community. And I'm an African-American, um, um, and as a black doctor in a white person's body, I've been a witness, a unique witness, to the kinds of racial bias that um, I now know affects the care and the outcomes for African-Americans. Um, so uh, that's basically, um, as we learn the statistics, um, three to four times as many black women die in childbirth or, or during pregnancy as white women. Uh, the, the breast cancer death rates are 60% higher for black women. And the, the impetus to, to do something about this is not strong enough in the medical um, establishment. So. Beverly and I decided that we needed to do something on our own and through the work with, with that we're doing with, with Pulse. So that's how, that's how I've been inspired. Mm -hmm. So would you say this is an offshoot of the Pulse um, program, okay, right. which you that's both exactly. are kind of focusing mm -hmm. in? Yes. So just so we know, what is Pulse? What is Pulse's, you know, Pulse New York? So we know the distinction okay. between them. So Pulse Center for Patient Safety, Education, and Advocacy um, is dedicated to raising awareness in the public about uh, preventable medical errors, about patient safety through education, advocacy, and support. Mm -hmm. And um, so preventable medical errors mm -hmm. is the third leading cause of death mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, for African Americans, uh, preventable deaths are also related to um, inequality, racial inequality in healthcare. Mm -hmm. In fact, 886,000 African Americans died between 1991 and mm -hmm. 2000, mm -hmm. specifically due to inequality in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So basically your organization is kind of an offshoot focusing specifically on women of color, African American women in particular, as it relates to what's happening and the disparities amongst right. uh, with it in terms of healthcare. Um, when you, particularly as, and I'm going to ask yourself, so because both of you are in the healthcare uh, um, field, and what have you noticed, even from your own professional interactions, particularly whether in hospitals, how have you seen, give me some eyewitness cases that you've seen of this. Well, I can tell you that initially when I was a student nurse, that's when it really smacked me in the face. Because um, part of our training we were allowed to pick patients when we were in particular fields. So for instance, in the medical surgical field, we would go into the hospital and you would review without looking at the ethnicity or race of a patient. And you would view on the diagnosis. 
And then when you would go and see, I would find that my fellow classmates were drawn to looking at Caucasian patients and ignoring black patients who were lying there in the bed. They were just not attended to. And it was disturbing because to me that was just unfair. And I wasn't quite sure how to address it. Um, actually, it was one of my professors who addressed it when she asked me why did I seem to choose African American patients. And I said, well, why is it that uh, the Caucasian students are not choosing them? And that they are people mm -hmm. in the bed and that we need to be seen as equal. I also noticed that um, I'm in home care. Mm -hmm. And very often when I would go to visit patients, I would notice that there were not equal treatment of the same diagnosis, same prognosis. And I would go to the home and I would see that um, medication wasn't the same, um, return visits weren't the same, the uh, tests, the diagnostic testing wasn't the same, and the explanation so that people understood what might be wrong with them. They were clueless compared to white people. And that's across the um, socioeconomic range. It was across the educational range. And it was across whether or not someone had insurance. So those are the kinds of things. And nursing is not about just passing bedpans and giving injections. Exactly. Nursing is all about teaching. And we're in a unique position. Physicians have a lot of stresses mm -hmm. on their time. We're in a unique position mm -hmm. to offer that teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why I left hospital care to do home care. Wow. Now, Dr. Farrington, you mentioned about, um, particularly as a professional in the field, particularly focusing on gynecological health. And obviously, what inspired you and what you heard from the field, and as you stated, that some people may perceive you as being Caucasian, what did you hear and what did that really inspired you that something needs to be done? I overheard the... Um, uh, white professionals uh, speaking in terms that were uh, less than respectful, um, more dealing in stereotypes uh, when talking about um, patients who were African American. And I noticed that there, there's sort of a disconnect. And this can, this is borne out in the statistics that um, uh, bias, especially subconscious bias, affects the treatment of African Americans. Uh, white doctors spend less time with their patients of color. Patients of color get less pain medication after broken bones. If you're African American, you are referred less for really important heart tests to diagnose heart conditions. And so what winds up happening is there's unequal treatment and um, the outcomes are worse. And it's, it's been shown in, in many different areas of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not new information. This is not new information. And so this is, um, uh, you get the, the feeling that the professionals have the same, you, you, you get the sense when you're working with them, or as I was working with them, that they had these biases. And then when I learned about the statistics, I could see the connection from mm -hmm. what I had experienced mm -hmm. and um, in my camouflage. Mm -hmm. So again, because people perceived you as being, you know, and well. um, like that is why. And so one of the things, and, the, and let's, I'm just going to play devil's advocate right now. Some people say, well, you know, maybe that's not, maybe some people, but how do you know that all healthcare professionals carry this racist bias? You know, a patient is a patient. For those who might question. So, so you, so it's uh, what the study of, of, um, Explicit and implicit bias has shown that stereotypes are deeply ingrained, and the um, this uh, ra these racial 
stereotypes and, and bias uh, was started to justify slavery hundreds of years ago. And the stereotypes persist, even if the person on a conscious level says, I'm not racist, they can't help but have mm -hmm. that ingrained uh, mm -hmm. Im implicit bias af affect their mm -hmm. behaviors mm -hmm. so that the white doctor is just a little bit uncomfortable and rushes through those visits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's important to go to doctors who see black patients mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. If you don't see many African Americans in the waiting room or mm -hmm. on staff, you have to wonder is that doctor uh, going to be as comfortable mm -hmm. as they might? And because it's, it's, the statistics bear it out. We know that racism, particularly whether it be the Tuskegee experiments of injecting African-American males with syphilis that resulted in you know, communities being infected or the uh, using you know, uh, our um, people of color as um, you know, and get, guinea pigs in these cases. So thinking about that person sitting in the, in the um, audience and who's wondering because they have to go to their doctor X, Y, and we're not saying that, you know, doctors outside of the African American community are necessarily, but how do you talk? What type of, what should we look for? What are some of the look fors, uh, Beverly, um, in terms of a person to, to identify these stereotypes and to address them, particularly for that person who has a, a, an appointment next week or tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Well, there are lots of tools that we can use. Um, one has to start being comfortable and taking responsibility themselves to know that you have the choice of being able to look for a physician that's going to match with you. So we tell people to ask until you understand, ask questions until you understand. When you get the answers, the doctor needs to be able to make certain that you are clear on what it is that they're asking you to do or directing you to do. Mm -hmm. You need to speak up to prevent errors. Sometimes they're not necessarily looking at you. You may walk into the doctor's office, they're looking down at the computer, or the laptop, or they're looking at lab results, and they're not really paying you mm -hmm. any attention. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you need to know your medical condition and your medications that you're on. So when you're in the doctor's office, in order for that encounter to become less intimidating, mm -hmm. Um, you need to be able to, again, like I say, be comfortable enough to talk with them. If you are picking up on something that is not right in your heart, you have to sometimes go with your gut, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> you have to look at that bedside mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. Is that doctor engaging you? Are they hearing you? Are they allowing you to participate in the plan that they have for your treatment? Are they certain that you understand that? This is your life. You need to be able to ask the questions. You need to be able to discuss and understand what the pros and cons are. You need to be able to find out, well, if you give me this medication, mm -hmm. if I take this medication, how does that help me? How might I expect to feel? What might the side effects be? If you find that that's not happening during that encounter, you need to bring it up. Mm -hmm. You need to address that doctor. And if they say to you, oh, you know, or they act surprised or, or concerned that you're concerned, mm -hmm. then that's probably a go. Mm -hmm. That's probably someone that you can work with. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you right now, if they get annoyed or dismissive or, you know, give you the feeling of how dare you, then you have to know that that is not the doctor for you. Mm -hmm. Every single doctor is not necessarily a match. Mm -hmm. There are some people who want to be told everything what to do, but there are others who need to be able to have a dialogue because we need to increase our health literacy. Mm -hmm. You may be an accountant and the doctor doesn't understand your lingo, okay? So you, you have, you have mm -hmm. power. And it's a two-way street. It's, exactly. it's a two-way street. 
So it's, it's basically that you, you, you want to be sure that you've got a connection, mm -hmm. that you're making eye contact. Uh, it, could be, it could start out with just a little small talk, mm -hmm. but make sure you make, you're getting eye contact. And then as the visit goes on, if something's amiss, something doesn't feel right, say, Doc, mm -hmm. do, do you treat other uh, mm -hmm. African Americans? Just, you know, <laughs> just want to make sure you feel comfortable. That um, and 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 that's that's going to be a, a question if if you don't feel that the doctor's uh, connecting properly. Now, Dr. Farrington, from your as you both have embarked upon this, how what has been the response from your colleagues to this mission in terms of this? And and they may consider accusa accusation that some of them are not being as fair to all patients. What has been the response so far? Um, what I, I've gotten uh, some negative feedback because there's the sense that they're already under so much pressure for time and um, um, for time and money mm -hmm. and uh, feeling that they, they need to work harder and to um, learn about medical advancements, etc. Mm -hmm. So the idea of of um, paying attention to more uh, other other subjects. Mm -hmm. It just seems like that's just more than they can bear mm -hmm. to bring up something else mm -hmm. on top of what else, whatever else they're they're uh, dealing with. Now, one of the things, as you both spoke, I thought about, you know, just like, as you know, there's a lot of concerns about the behavior of some of our uh, law enforcement officers as it relates to people of color, and we've heard of abuses and, and atrocities around the country. Um, what type of steps do you think that maybe doctors and nurses could benefit from some cultural sensitivity as relates to relating to people within the African American community and others? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, there, there's uh, the training that we're you're mentioning is called cultural competency, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's um, training that's being promoted to make healthcare professionals aware of their bias, mm -hmm. aware of their bias, so that they can. Um, set it aside when they need to, mm -hmm. to so that they can uh, become more mindful and compassionate in the healthcare setting. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this, it's very difficult to put some more training mm -hmm. on people who are already feeling a certain amount of burnout, mm -hmm. a certain amount of time pressure. Um, so, but there is, there is a movement in, in mm -hmm. the, your um, academic circles mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I've, I've been reading about these, and so I can mm -hmm. tell you some of the resources that are out there. Mm -hmm. But the the bottom line is, although we know what training is needed, mm -hmm. it's um, there's obstacles to implementing mm -hmm. that that training. You know, when we think about doctors, a lot of times, you know, there are a lot of doc people entering the medical field who are becoming doctors and, and, and nurses who are from other countries, from Asian countries, Latino countries. And sometimes you see the same stereotypical th thinking as it relates to African Americans. Um, so I, when you think about cultural sensitivity, you know, how we can make our doctors and nurses sensitive to the communities they serve, I just wanted to think about what strategies you would recommend as a um, healthcare professional, starting with the medical field in both of you, what type of training could be offered to ensure that doctors, regardless of what, understand the communities they serve? So there is uh, training and cultural competency that's being promoted um, because there's a recognition that the health of all communities is dependent on doctors and nurses being more culturally uh, sensitive. Mm -hmm. So th there is uh, training that's available. Uh, the problem is that uh, getting the time for doctors and nurses to participate in that training. But it's, it's, it's sort of new, um, a new development. And um, we're going to see more people being trained. Mm -hmm. But um, it ta it's, it's going to be hard for them to overcome the implicit or subconscious bias mm -hmm. that, that's been ingrained in them mm -hmm. from growing up. 
So we need to work together. Mm -hmm. It's important for the, the patient to make mm -hmm. sure, to sort of bridge mm -hmm. to that place where both the patient uh, themselves and the, the nurse or doctor are, see each other as humans first and mm -hmm. not uh, of a different, a different uh, background. Mm -hmm. And I find that the culture of the organization is important. Uh, so particularly in home care, it's easier to deal with it than in the hospital. There are some booklets and handouts called cultural competency, and I believe a lot of it will dissipate over time. Mm -hmm. Nothing is automatic. Mm -hmm. By immersion, the more diverse your doctor's office staff and patients are, the more diverse the patients are that you see, then the easier it may become to recognize that there are differences. There's male, there's female, there's black, there's white. But mm -hmm. the difference doesn't make or shouldn't make a difference mm -hmm. in how you care for that human, human person. And that's what we have to overcome. Mm -hmm. Because when we see the difference in healthcare, we automatically, at this point, are making assumptions. We are making assumptions, but the, the difference should not be a, a negative response. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that there are many flowers in the garden. Mm. And when you put all those flowers together, you have a beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. And until we can see that as one another people of, of, that we're all the same, mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to get past this. And unfortunately, because we can't do it top down, mm -hmm. we have to do it through Pulse, organizations like Pulse, mm -hmm. grassroots up. Mm -hmm. So we have to give the mm -hmm. education, the power to the people who are on the receiving end of the care. Mm -hmm. They should be the focal point. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's so important that we really support and get the information out. And, and certainly we appreciate the fact that both of you are on the brand guard, putting it out there and basically giving people an opportunity to talk about their care and talk about and come confront the biases and to, to overcome them because ultimately we have to move forward as a nation where we start to treat people uh, equally and treat people with respect. Um, let's talk about what it is that people, what would you want to leave people with as they consider what you've stated and how they can find out more information about your organization? Um, I think the, the take home message should be make sure you're getting treated as, as if you were the friend or family of that doctor. Uh, make sure you're connecting with that doctor on a personal level and that you feel comfortable communicating with that doctor or nurse. Um, I think that's, that's key. Mm -hmm. I know every time one goes to the doctor, whether it's for a checkup or um, it's an emergent visit, you know, there's a little nervousness about it. But once you're on the other side of that door and you're with that physician or with that nurse, there should be a comfort level that you trust and you have confidence in the relationship. And I think that's very, very important for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we start to we think about the importance of there being equality in the healthcare field, please uh, share with our audience some parting words that you'd like to inform them about. So I think it's key that we ask our doctors to treat us as they would want their family or friends to be treated. Um, if we don't get that sense, we should talk about that to the doctor and uh, make sure we have the, a, a good connection mm -hmm. with that doctor. And we, um, we, will, we will hopefully, uh, by promoting that humane aspect of healthcare, uh, we'll bridge those, we'll, we'll bypass the bias that mm -hmm. um, most people hold. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there is a documentary that you're working on. Tell us about yes. that. Yes, the documentary is following the work that we're doing at, on this project, which we call Women of Color and Healthcare uh, Inequality. So um, the challenges that women of color face, uh, we've been working on studying those and um, 
putting together a documentary covering that project um, and, um, and, and demonstrating through um, videotape scenarios how to interact with the healthcare provider to get better outcomes. And for those who might be interested in finding out more about your work and, and how they can get involved, tell us how they can contact you. They can contact us at www.healthcareequality.org. Can you say that one more time? www.healthcareequality.org. Well, I just want to say on behalf of Cultural Caravan, I salute the work that both of you are doing in terms of educating uh, our community, the broader community, about the importance of equality in healthcare fields. And we look forward to having you back and, and, and to, as you talk about this wonderful project that you have coming in a documentary that I understand. But until then, I want to say thank you both so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. For well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast, and we continue to encourage you to tune in, to write, and to tell a friend. And please visit our website at www.cctv.org. But until next time, Louise Dente saying thank you. Mm -hmm.